Months ago I made a video about my MA at the University of York. That video was about my first semester and I do talk about my experience of starting an MA um, but I mainly focus on Victorian literature. In that video I talk about how when I started my MA I thought that I would be focusing on 19th century and 20th century literature but what actually happened is that I mainly focused on 18th century writing. Before I start I should actually mention that I finished my MA now. I've handed in my dissertation. My dissertation was on Victorian social novels. It was on the idea of the working class hero and the mediation of class relations in Mary Barton and North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell and Out and Lock by Charles Kingsley. Because I've actually finished my MA now, all of this feels a really, really long time ago. I'm just going to briefly talk about what I studied. I feel like there isn't a lot of 18th century representation on YouTube, so I'm hoping that some of you will go away and want to read some amazing 18th century pieces of writing, um, and maybe give an insight into what it would be like to study an 18th century course, whether that's at maybe even undergraduate or at master's level. If you want to know more about 18th century writing, I've actually filmed a video with Dr Adam James Smith, who is just amazing, he's so great, and he's a lecturer for my old university where I did my undergraduate at York St John. I had a lot of fun on my 18th century modules. I learnt so much because my knowledge of the 18th century was quite limited. I had done a module on it at university, but it wasn't something I read for pleasure, I didn't know a lot about the history, and so out of everything I've studied at my MA, even though it was really, really hard work and kind of really push me to my limits, I have taken so much from studying this period. The modules I studied were fashion and material culture in the 18th century, which was in my first semester. I had the most fun in my second semester because I had amazing modules. One of them was called, I think, Wollstonecraft to Jane Austen, Femininity in Literary Culture, and the other one was representing the city 1650 to 1850. For fashion and material culture, the majority of our study was focused on this book, which actually I really like and kind of want to keep. It is called The Commerce of Everyday Life, Selections from the Tatler and the Spectator. The Tatler and the Spectator are two 18th century periodicals and they're really, really great to read. 18th century print culture is fascinating and the 18th century is really like the age of satire. And so the periodicals are satiric, but they also want to teach you things. We started this module with 18th century coffee houses. You would go, if you were a man and of privilege, to coffee houses where you would get your news, discuss it with other people and drink your coffee. When you look at an 18th century map of London, there are so many coffee houses and you would go to a different one depending on what kind of person you were or what kind of information you wanted. And interesting, the tattle actually splits out the periodical by the different coffee houses. All accounts of gallantry, pleasure and entertainment shall be under the article of White's Chocolate House. Poetry under that of Will's Coffee House. Learning under the title of The Grecian. Foreign and domestic news you will have from St James's Coffee House. And what else I have to offer on any other subject shall be dated from my own apartment. Men of the Tatler and of the Spectator can go to these different coffee houses, but they can also go to their own apartments. But the female Tatler is kind of confined in the domestic. Any news she gets comes from other people. There's an interesting crossover between when women become a part of business, especially in coffee houses, when it says that women can actually be in charge of the coffee houses, but they couldn't drink there. There's a lot of representations of women being seen as sex workers because they're selling things. Women are always placed on the market for men to consume. In literature, poetry in the 18th century, you're constantly taken into the drawing room, an area of performance of getting yourself ready for society. Part of that, we looked at the ladies' dressing room by Jonathan Swift. I was fascinated by the dressing room because I'm kind of really interested in the idea of the country house and where boundaries put in in private spaces and how much kind of privacy is given um, and who kind of comes into dressing rooms. Especially with women who, you know, don't own property, they have this one space in these country houses that are their own and they're constantly kind of being interrupted by men or being mocked by men. Men have, you know, male closets and it's interesting that they're always spaces for intellect, um, whereas women are kind of, you know, it's all about dress and performance. I guess in a way on the surface, the business of women was to look beautiful and alluring and the business of men was to be wise and intelligent. We studied so much that it's hard to remember what we studied. We studied The Rape of the Lock uh, by Pope 
and looked at and, and, and looked at the idea of undressing, which is what I focused on, um, and the idea of kind of ornament versus nature. I think what you'll probably notice by reading quite a lot of 18th century that there is a lot of undressing of women, which I think is kind of um, symptomatic of a male anxiety over that they're going to be like fooled by a woman um, because actually it's all fake, it's all a lie. We looked at materials taking on their own life and probably one of my favourite things that uh, we studied was the memoirs and adventures of an embroidered waistcoat. Kind of one big confession of all these scandals that the master has been involved in. Items of clothing constantly say, well I'm you know, telling the truth and basically just go on to talk about sex and all their sexual adventures of their owners. 18th century and sex is probably one of my favourite research areas. I spent a lot of the time in the library reading 18th century erotica. Um, some of the pictures were quite alarming but definitely worth a read if you're interested in the representation of sex and sexuality in literature. Those pieces of material are also symbolic of commerce because they're bought and worn. The 18th century was really the era where shopping changed. It was a time when kind of shops became places that you would go uh, to spend some leisurely time. The era of kind of, you know, going to a mall with your friends kind of really started in the 18th century. The of the 18th century is obsessed with the idea of sociability and shops became undoubtedly sociable places. The favourite book that I studied on this module was Evelina by Frances Burney. In Evelina we looked at the idea of sensibility as Evelina is undoubtedly a heroine of sensibility. Sensibility is basically the idea that you're kind of very sensitive and you feel very strongly. Although the idea about sensibility is not just about women, and men are depicted as crying and being feminine, which of course was always seen as a weakness. In Evelina though, the idea of sensibility and sympathy was actually a sign of having a moral code. And it is Evelina's possession of sensibility that actually leads to her saving a life. Francis Burney inspired Jane Austen, and I always see a link between those two writers. So I think if you are a fan of Jane Austen, you definitely need to check out some Francis Burney. And Evelina is a really, really great book. We ended with the novel Pamela, which wasn't a massive fan of. It was, however, one of those books that I really enjoyed studying, although I would ever read it for pleasure again. What I love about kind of 80 social novels is that so often modern editions have the like the the first kind of title page um, from the original book. Pamela or Virtue Rewarded in a series of familiar letters from a beautiful young damsel to her parents, now first published, in order to cultivate the principles of virtue and reason in the minds of the youth of both sexes. A narrative which has its foundation in truth and nature, at the same time that is agreeably entertained by a variety of curious and affecting incidents. It is entirely diverted of all those images, which in too many pieces calculated for amusement only tend to infl inflame the minds that they should instruct. So, the background has changed, and that is because when I was filming the first section of that video, my camera just kind of stopped working. And so now I'm back in London and I'm gonna continue talking about my MA. Where I left off was Samuel Richardson's Pamela. My favorite things about this novel and about a lot of the texts I kind of actually have studied is about the obsession in the 18th century about validity and the truth of a story. And this happens all the way throughout Pamela in her letters. It's an epistolary novel. But interestingly, the novel begins with a note from the editor. So from the very beginning, the validity of Pamela's story is brought into question. You're supposedly presented with Pamela's letters, but they have been edited. Moving on to my second semester, I'm not actually going to talk about my module representing the city, mainly because I'm currently working on a little project for myself which is called Reading London, I'll put a link to that in the description in one of the cards. And so much of the study in that module was about London, and so I kind of want to use the information that I learnt on that module um, to inspire future videos. But in my second semester I studied another amazing module which was called Wollstonecraft to Jane Austen, Femininity in Literary Culture. After a very male-dominated Victorian module, the idea of being faced with just like loads of women was amazing. As the module suggests, we started with Wollstonecraft. Wollstonecraft's Rights of Woman is one of my favourite texts. It's very problematic, but really interesting. Wollstonecraft looks at the false system of education which she believed kind of made women domestic brutes and restricted their agency because of their lack of access to education and therefore reason was kind of taken over by sensibility. 
Wollstonecraft is arguing for women to take a more equal place in society. She wants them to have employment and controversially at the time she actually wants them to be political, she wants them to be MPs. Women need to earn money, they need to be in partnership with men and they need to stop kind of reading these sentimental novels which depict them as just being lazing around on their chaise long with their lap dogs. In this module we also looked at quite a bit of 18th century poetry which is actually something throughout my modules I don't think I looked at a lot really. I looked at two poets in particular, Mary Robinson and Charlotte Smith. Again, 18th century poetry isn't really my thing but what I found really fascinating was actually the preface uh, to the poems and especially Mary Robinson's. Robinson takes up the sonnet form, a form which is kind of dominated by men and with the literary greats such as Milton and Shakespeare. She powerfully takes over this form and owns it. But what I love most about this preface is how unashamedly political it is. I'm just going to quote from Robinson here. It is the interest of the ignorant and powerful to suppress the effusions of enlightened minds. Through her poem she says that she pays tribute to the talents of my illustrious countrywomen who, unpatronised by the courts and unprotected by the powerful, persevere in the paths of literature. In a society telling women that their business was to be beautiful and to be mothers and to be maternal and domestic, Robinson champions women who pick up their pen. Moving on to prose now, we have Charlotte Smith's novel Desmond. The narrative follows the French Revolution and because at the time as Smith is writing you have this real political immediacy. The narrative follows the revolution, so you see the changes of kind of opinions towards it. So you end with attitudes inclined towards social reform rather than revolution. This is something that I discussed in my dissertation. My dissertation was about 19th century literature, but something which I've noticed in a lot of writing that involves themes of revolution is that the answer is always social reform. It's written in letters and you have this patchwork of various different voices. What I really love about letters and novels is that you have delays and miscommunications. There is one letter, for instance, that is mentioned but never included in the text, which brings into question its validity. There is also just a lot of intertextual references to other writers. There is this really wonderful moment where Smith is just playing with genre and goes into literary criticism and discusses the theatre. We then looked at the gothic tale of a Sicilian Romance by Anne Radcliffe. After studying Anne Radcliffe, we then moved on to Jane Austen with Northanger Abbey. Northanger Abbey was the first class I've ever read, didn't really like it, then read it as an undergrad and kind of liked it, and now reading it as an MA student, I really like this novel. I think it's a really interesting story of a Buddings Roman uh, narrative which kind of looks at gothic um, styles and plays with the genre. Just a really great novel. I think Jane Austen is, is just amazing. She's one of my favourite writers. I think Northanger Abbey is a really great way to start if you haven't read any Jane Austen because it's smaller and it is easy to read as well. What was funny was because I gave away um, my edition of Northanger Abbey after I finished my undergraduate, so I had to borrow Ben's copy of Northanger Abbey. And when I opened it up, I was you know, really hoping to see so many annotations so I could see what he felt and what he thought about this novel when we studied it in our first year. And I opened up the book and it was just completely empty. There were no annotations or anything because I knew my book was just covered in annotations and I dog-eared the pages and I was presented um, by Ben this very pristine copy of this novel. I actually have done a review of Nothing Abbey. This review is now like four years old so I even look at it and cringe but um, a lot of the things that I found interesting in my undergraduate I still find interesting now so I'll put a link to that in the description or in the cards. Another novel I'd never heard of before studying this MA The Memoirs of Emma Courtney by Mary Hayes. Mary Hayes is, is just fascinating. She was a dissenter and very active in social circles. The Memoirs of Emma Courtney are obviously presented as memoirs so from the very beginning you have the genre of biography and in particular a woman's biography. Autobiography, I mean it's supposed to be Emma who's writing this. You have this mixing of life stories and life writing because in the appendix of this edition, this is the Broadview edition, there are Mary Hayes letters. These letters basically appear in the novel. With the scandalous details in this novel you really have this blurring between the fact of Mary Hayes' life and the fiction of Mary Courtney's. The novel at the time was deemed a scandalous disrobing in public. 
it challenges society's views of women and the inequalities between men and women really powerfully. For the 18th century, there's some really controversial stuff in this novel. In one of her letters to William Godwin, she basically just challenges the view that men can you know, go around and kind of have sex um, and, and women can't and that inequality and that double standard which is still around today really. This novel is full of powerful social commentary but remains really really readable and accessible. I think if you're interested in the position of women in history and in literature and haven't maybe read as much 18th century writing, go and pick up the memoirs of Emma Courtney because it's a really interesting read. We ended this module as expected with another Jane Austen novel and we read Mansfield Park. I feel like I'm saying this a lot in this video. Mansell Park is not one of my favourite books for pleasure, but I really enjoy studying it. The way that I had studied this book as an undergraduate and kind of what I decided to write my essays on was really looking at the novel as a critique of sensibility. But what was really interesting to me is that in my MA we really looked at the novel and its relation to empire and slavery. In Mansell Park you have that very interesting scene where everybody's kind of sitting down and Fanny brings up the question of slavery and there's this awkward silence. It is that one small moment which just ripples and really changes, I think, the tone of the novel for me. Slavery in a lot of writing in the 18th century and 19th century in particular uh, use slavery as a metaphor. Wollstonecraft uses slavery to say that women have kind of become domestic slaves because of sensibility. And in Mansell Park you have the tyrannical Sir Thomas and the question of the oppression of women in his household. When we were in our seminar we looked at the idea of commercial transaction quite a bit and the idea of transaction as in the marriage market as well in the novel. Fanny's surname is Price so even with that character you have that instant connection with money and transaction. Fanny's character is always put aside in Jane Austen like nobody really often says that they want to be you know Fanny Price when you get those like Buzzfeed which Jane Austen heroine are you? Constantly forgotten about, left behind, you know, she'll just silently be in the corner and everybody's forgotten she even existed. But Fanny really is, in this novel, an agent of reform. I think she's the heroine that everybody forgets about and that everybody needs to go and read again, really. I really hope that um, I've given you an insight into studying 18th century just a little bit um, and that you have some new reads, especially some reads by women, um, that I hope you go and check out.